and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net and on YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast edition from FunkinStuff.net, iTunes, and most leading providers. I'm your host, Scott Dr. G. Excolfi, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk. Get your copy at Amazon. Whether you're watching or listening, I thank you so much for your continued support and interest. And you tuned into a great show once again today because my guest is singer Joe Pep Harris, best known for his decade of work with the Motown singing group Undisputed Truth. That's right. The group, along with um, the other two singers, Billy Ray Calvin and Brenda Joyce Evans, got very well known being produced by Norman Whitfield, the legendary producer out of Motown, who uh, was responsible for so many of the great Temptations hits and other songs like that. And Undisputed Truth actually covered several Temps hits as well. Their biggest one was Smiling Faces in 1971, which went to number three on the pop charts. They had eight albums in the 1970s and eight top 40 R&B singles. And some of those other singles I just want to share with you before bringing Joe on. Um, i got them right here. So we had Smiling Faces in 71. In 72, the cover of Papa's Rolling Stone, the Temp's uh, great hit, went to 24. And uh, 74, Help Yourself, was a, another high-charting hit. And 76, You Plus Me equals Love. And actually, that's the name of the song, but I, I can't say without saying and harmony because that's what I'm used to. But uh, that's actually the track that really got me into the group because in my age range, I was a teenager then, and that was a, a huge hit song, got to number five on the dance charts. So with all that said, I am so honored and happy to have with us today Joe Pep Harris. Joe, how are you doing today? I'm great, Scott. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm great. Yeah, so you're coming to us from Motor City. Yeah, yeah, the home Motown. I'm back in Detroit. Yeah, and um, it's great. I'm I'm working on a few things, and you know, how, you know, we'll see how it goes. Excellent. I've been blessed enough to have another stretch in my career from the '50s. So yeah. Wow. Well, but you look great. You know. So congratulations on that. Mm -hmm. So Joe, tell me a little bit about you know how you guys got started. Um, must have been amazing to be around that environment at that time. Uh, Motown, just legendary with all those great acts and Barry Gordy. What was it like being at the center of that? Wow. Uh, wow. I mean, I was, um, let me just reflect on how I reflect. Yesterday, I was, we had a welcome back home to Detroit to Brittany Joyce Evans, who was the original lead singer with us. And uh, after all these years, and she's back looking great, sounding just as great. And we had a, so many folks there, and everybody was talking about that era. Most of, you know, everybody from Motown and some other folks from some of the other companies that were Melvin Davis, I um, mean, he'd been around to Temptation's first drummer, to Smokey's first drummer, big writing career with Don Davis and J.J. Barnes, they done wrote for everybody. And, uh, and that was the whole reflection of how we get a chance now to reflect and see about the things that we never were really looking at. We were living, mm -hmm. you know, people talk about it. We were living it. So we get to, to, to talking to other folks that were there and seeing their opinions and hearing the things that they, how they felt and thought about it in their younger ages. You know, I was like, wow, this is, I mean, this is a God moment, you know, um, and yesterday was just more than just a, a getting together of us. I mean, it was really a, a moment to reflect back. I mean, something that you just asked me about, uh, the way you asked me, you know, it seemed so simple to be able to answer. But like I said, we were living it. And I, I run into people that were there and I started remembering, wow, 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 Will Hatcher, uh, oh, uh, it's dramatics. I mean, it was so many folks. Uh, yesterday, J.J. Barnes, uh, McKinley Jackson. I mean, all these folks when I started, you know, and we were just uh, uh, reflecting. 
and Motown, when I got with Motown, the, the irony of that is I, when, I, when I got out of high school, I, start, I started singing with uh, 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 a group called The Peps. And that was all, everything from the day that I stepped out of high school. Later, after I was out of high school, my cousin Lee Rogers, who was a very popular singer in Detroit at that time, took me to a club. First night I walk into this club, the first person I see is Walter Jackson, David Ruffin. So I was like, wow, I'm right in the middle of it. And before that night is over, I had met everybody from uh, Richard Street to Betty LeVette, you know, uh, and that became my hangout. <laughs> you know, I had to put plain a mustache on a lot of times to being out there in some of those places, but I was there. There was so much talent. I mean, there's a lot of talent in Detroit right now. The difference between then and now is the opportunities. The opportunities, since I've been back here in Detroit three years, I see, I feel that there's some sort of suppression of all the things that make or made the era from which I came from today, because with all the technology today, we shouldn't have any problems to be about having an environment that would recreate and keep creating. We were enjoying. Uh, we never thought about it. It was all second nature. But when I think about it now, I go, there's like one place in Detroit that we would go and, and, and people would meet up or hang out. It's, it's called Burt's. And you run into people from way back in the era, from Four Tops to uh, Kim West and all those folks and go in the birds and have a drink, have something to eat, maybe watch a jazz show or a blues show. It's got three or four different parts in there. So people go and then hang out for many different things because it's in the places where people get the opportunity to perform. That's how I learned. I didn't learn to perform by rehearsing. I learned to, re I got out of school. I went straight to a stage somewhere and I'm oh, in it. And in it, I was like, whoa, and I was on the ride. I did trying to figure out what I was going to do. I mean, I had a scholarship, but you know, I was like, whoa, I, uh, this singing thing, because I had started singing. I recorded my first record in the 50s, uh, the Little Joe and the Moroccos. And when I got out of junior high school, went to high school, my mama mixed that, all of that. No singing. You're going to get a diploma and do whatever you need to do after that. So I did that. And um, I was with the Ohio players. And um, there was a lot of um, uh, creative difference between myself and the new guy who happened to be voted the band leader then because he was trying to concept the group. At a particular time, had just left the peps. Well, we were still working back and forth with the peps. I was working with the peps and doing something, something as a solo artist and working with uh, the Ohio players. We were forming the Ohio players then. And um, Joe, who was the leader uh, of the Ohio players at that time? What, what year are we talking? About uh, 1967, 68, 60. After the riots in Detroit, 69. I would go back to about 69. This was just before I got, well, 68 years I had been working back and forth. Of course, I had been working with them when they were the Ohio players with the Peps. And then I did a lot of solo work with them as the Ohio, as Ohio Untouchables, I'm sorry. And um, uh, when the Ohio Untouchables broke up, I was with Robert Ward for a year. And before that year was out, Satch from the Ohio players, at later to be Ohio players, came and said, man, we we got a lot of work and we need somebody to front the group. And I was like, oh yeah, because I mean, Robert wasn't working a lot. And I was working back and forth, like I say, with the Peps. So I when I started working with the Ohio players. We formed as the Ohio players. And the only thing that I didn't, it was I didn't sign a contract with a production company that they signed, signed with. It's called Compass Productions. I didn't like the contract, you know, and I didn't sign. And that was the first little, um, impasse that I got with the guy that was leading the group at that time. Uh, he was the, the band leader. He was a drummer. And uh, um, when Nick, right on down, down the road away, he, he wanted me to, uh, my show was a variety with Ohio players. We did 
played all kind of music and I could sing all those different genres from rock to anything. And James Brown a lot. Oh, James Brown and Wilson Pickett. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> no. So I started getting fanned on a lot of shows and stuff, and I started complaining about it. And one day, he came and said, well, we're going to go in a different direction. I mean, crush me. I was crushed. I was with the, one of the baddest bands in the land. Creative differences, you know. And I left that, that day. We were in, um, um, we had just finished in uh, Evansville, Indiana. And I left and went to Louisville, Kentucky. I used to work for Harvey Fuqua, who was with the Moon Gloves, and at Motown at that time. He had a club in Evansville, Indiana. So I let him know that I, I knew I was going to be leaving the group because we, when they started talking about meetings, you know, between him, he and I, one of us once was going to go. You know, and I, I don't never be in anything that's a friendship train, you know. It's really, the, if this is how you want to go, y'all go this way, we're going to, because I'm serious about this. This is what I do. Um, I got fired that Sunday, and that Wednesday, I opened up in a club in Louisville called the Golden Barrel with a group at that time were called Nightlighters. And um, when I got there, Harvey was talking to me, and he said, well, uh, uh, I want you to do a couple of weeks here with the Nightlighters, which I did. And at that time, I was living in Toronto and Detroit. So uh, we decided that we were going to be a group, and I booked some dates in Toronto. We left and went to Toronto. While we were in Toronto, I would run back and forth in between uh, off days and come to Detroit. And when I got to Detroit, uh, Bobby Taylor was in the 20 Grand Club walked into the 20 grand and they got it only 20 grand at one time that managed me when I was with a group called the Peps. And um, he um, he asked me what we were doing because he had a show, he needed a show behind Bobby Taylor and them because whoever was supposed to come in would cancel because somebody got sick. So I said, well, I got a, a, a new group. And he said, well, come on in. I came in with a guy named Theron T. Man here. And uh, we went and opened the 20 grand as the Nightlighters, Joe Pep and the Nightlighters. We didn't book like that because I've never been, I didn't want my name, I'd be a part of everything. But we, that's he, they put that up on the thing like that. So anyway, days in those 10 days in there, Norman Whitfield was there every night, except the last night. Norman Whitfield and Clay McMurray. Clay McMurray was another writer, producer at uh, Motown who had a big hit with um, uh, Gladys Knight, If I Were Your Woman. And, um, and he did Stand By Me, Spider Turner. He did quite a few things. Daughter Sings with uh, uh, Blackstone. Very, uh, me and Clay are still tight today. He's the guy that came up with the name Undisputed Truth. When we were searching names, we had a whole lot of names that we went through Ice Cream and then Undisputed Truth. So before we decided on what name we were going to use. So uh, Norman, uh, that last night at the 20 grand, Norman Whitfield, um, uh, asked, had Clay to come down. Norman was in the studio with the Temps that night. And Clay came and told me, he said, Norman, want to see you tomorrow, Monday, at Motown, if you're going to be in town. I was like, yeah, okay. You know, so the guys were, 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 were supposed to go back to that next day. But Harvey Fuqua, who was working for Motown, and we were working for him, and look, happened to be in Detroit at that time. And he asked the guys in the band were you, if they were off. And they were saying, yeah, we're going to be off for two weeks. And he said, well, look, I got this. The spinners need a band. So they were going to go on the road with the spinners. Now, this was, we, we hadn't talked about none of this before I knew what Norman wanted. You know, and I'm just saying this because all these things happened approximately at around the same time. Norman offered me a position in a group that he wanted to form. And I kept going, I said, I hear every night. And he said, man, I've seen you at the 20 grand a million times with every situation I've seen you in, you've excelled. You know, you have. He said, I was wondering, well, what you going to do behind the paps? And then what you going to do behind this? And then I come in with the nightlighters, and they were killing. And uh, they eventually end up being called Newberg. When I left, the Wilson brothers came into the group, and, and uh, Lottie, who was uh, who uh, Hobby had been recording in and out of Motown a lot, uh, they, they joined the group, and he changed the name of the group. I left and went with Norman. He offered me an opportunity because he said he wanted to put. This is what how if people I've heard a, a thousand stories about 
The Undisputed Truth and Norman Whitfield's reason for putting this group together. He, this is what he told me. For years, uh, we were, uh, the peps were a nemesis in, in the sense as a, to, the, to Motown because we came on stage with no vengeance with, for anybody. It wasn't personal, but we were the only, always the only group on those shows without a hit record. <laughs> so the only thing we could do we had, we had going for us was to perform. So the, the, the higher the status of that persons that we were performing in front of was how we mentally put ourselves together to make sure that when the date was over, people gonna remember us. The, the guy thing that we say, we got to make sure that everything we do count. So um, <clears throat> Norman Whitfield at that time would tell us, he said, some people may be coming to try to sign you guys in Motown, don't come because they want to set you down. You know, and I had already had, heard that because I know the dramatics and a few other groups that went to Motown and they told them, we don't need no other groups. We're great with groups. We don't need another group. So, I mean, you know, but I mean, just in and in, in, in the secret, uh, in reality, for what, what we had going for us, that we were assigned, uh, we had been signed to North, uh, Barry's first wife, Thelma Goy. And so nobody really approached us until we left there and signed with Martha Jean the Queen, who was a big DJ in Detroit, and Roger Brown and Pete Hall, who were football players, pro football players, and they were the ones that orchestrated our career on an upward spiral. Every everything we did before that was on from the muscle. We would we would go and open shows for both the Dales. The Dales used to call us all the time, say, "Man, we." We got a, a, a tour coming. We got three or four people that we want to put on this. We need you guys to open. And we would do those things. And then we started doing the theaters with no hit record. So in the theaters with no hit records, you know, you look back and you say, who's who's on the show we opening? So by the time the OJs or the uh, the Dales or uh, Chuck Jackson or somebody come on, they're going to be forgot about us. So we if we're going to open this show. We want them to remember the opening, or we want to open like we were closing. <laughs> we didn't have it six minutes most of the time. And we got a reputation for being tightly performed because one of the guys in the group, Ronnie Abner, was a trained dancer. I mean, and a dancer like no other dancer. If James Brown was alive, he would tell you. It's the first week we were in the Apollo, we went with Chuck Jackson to the Apollo. We did seven days there. We had did 10 days in the 20 grand with Chuck Jackson and Yvonne Fair. Huge success with Chuck Jackson was the, um, I would say the uh, uh, Marvin Gaye of his time. I mean, he would, I mean, he, he, guys around him like uh, 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 Benny King and, and Lloyd Price and all those guys. But at this particular point in time, Chuck Jackson was king. And we came into Detroit and he hired us to open. So it's got, got to be bad, you know, because we used to go watch him. So we had to put our show together with Chuck and knowing that he had the baddest, one of the baddest bands in the land. So we tightened up. We put our show together and did 10 days in the 20 grand. And the thing that he said he liked about our show was it was never the same every night. We sing the same songs because, you know, we had to learn those with his band. Every night we did a different show only because we were from Detroit and Motown set the standard then and their standard was train all your acts so that they can perform to be together to have the finesse and all those things. We stole all the little stuff we can get the other stuff they were up and the guys like that when they used to see give us little tips about things that that they learned and that would help us. So we, we put that stuff together and Ronnie Abner groomed us. Uh, to be able to watch seeing what we used to call, watch me, and then we go from there. We always had a basic rhythm or a basic step. If you ever seen, um, uh, 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 what's the name, the, 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 the female singer from Europe that died a few years, uh, Amy Winehouse. You ever see the guys behind her and how they had a baby? We would go to some basic step, and every time I see them, I'd see the peps to a certain degree. But we had a little bit more 
more, more rhythm in, in the movements of our steps so that you can know that it was something that was crafted. Of, but we had our own individualism. Didn't rehearse it. We got it, worked it out, and then let it go. So we do it when we're on stage. It's all in time. And um, we did those seven days at the uh, Apollo. And at the end of the at the end of the uh, the last night, Chuck's manager came to the uh, dressing room and said that Chuck couldn't take us no further. He said there's too much heat on the shelf. This is exactly words. He said, "Yeah, making him work too hard." We were supposed to go to the Bahamas, but you know, so instead of the, uh, um, I mean, we was crushed. I mean, we was really crushed because you know we first we saw an example, and then the thing that was really questioned about it was not because we weren't good enough. You know, but you know, we, you know, and that was his show, and he, him, him knowing how entertainers think, he knew that. Uh, well, uh, let me. I ain't gonna get into Chuck's head, but I mean, I, this is how I deduced it. He knew what was happening; that these guys were working hard, which was causing him to work hard. All then we didn't never let up. We would do. We would open the show in the Apollo four times a day. And every show, people were in the first part of the show to catch the paps. We didn't have no hit records, but they said these guys were performing and flipping and spinning. And the guy that was the um, the, the stage man of Honey Cones, he was from Bartville. And he told us after that, Chuck Jackson, he said, whatever you guys doing, he said, don't change anything. <laughs> you know, people telling y'all, y'all need to be choreographed like the pips and all that. And the pips were the best I've ever seen. So, you know, we didn't want to be the Pips, and the name Pips came from Richard Street. Richard Street started the Pips, and uh, that was with Thelmas. But anyway, uh, Chuck left, left us in the Apollo at the end of the day. The guy from the Apollo, Bobby Schiffman, offered us another seven days. We took it. Of course, we took it. Opening for Tommy Hunt in the, at his show. And at the end of the Tommy Hunt show, we after Tommy Hunt show, we were... We were we were pretty sure that we were going to be coming back to the Apollo more than but Rocky G, who was a big DJ in New York, was coming into the Apollo with the with the show called The Battle of the Groups. And he came to us and said, um, uh, I'm going to stick you guys on the show and I'm going to have to just make hand flyers. Your name won't be up on the outside of the thing, but. And, but they end up putting it up there, way at the bottom of the peps, all in on the polos, which is the first time we ever had up. That's why I mentioned that. And um, Edwin Starr was on the show with us. Edwin Starr was a very good friend of ours. In fact, Edwin Starr was one of the guys that, when I was with the peps, we, uh, as we traveled around the country and worked with different places, we'd run into folks. And we ran into Edwin Starr first in Detroit. And then we both were playing in Buffalo, New York. And Edwin Starr was saying, man, I got to go back to Detroit. I, I mean, he said he was working for Bill Doggett and he wanted to do something different. But he had a, a, a some kind of arrangements with Bill Doggett and every time they leave, they get on a bus and go. And so he wanted to go to Detroit and he didn't have no way he jumped in the car with us. <laughs> we took him to Detroit. The rest of his stuff was history, he was double O soul, and that was history. Didn't see him no more until I got to Motown. I mean, we've seen, you know, I didn't go to too many shows. We were working all the time, but I'd seen him passing. But when I got with Motown, he and I were being produced by Norman Whitfield. And that was an irony. But, uh, uh, and I'm saying all of this in this in this fashion is because uh, I, I never thought about that. I've been asked that question by many people, many guys that I've um, uh, interviewed with. And you know you think spontaneously of what come on come at your head at the moment, and then when that's over, you say, "Wow, I could have uh, said a lot of things." And Martha Jean, who was my manager for a long time, I went on. Uh, we did. We went to uh, to Memphis. They heard P. Hall sent us to Memphis to do an album or do some things for an album with uh, Willie Mitchell. This was during the time of Al Green's uprising in '67. I think this was around 66, 67. And, um, uh, and I went, as soon as the record was released, I went on the radio with her to talk about the record. And I was talking like I'm talking to you now about the careers and how we got to what she asked about how the peps got together. And I just started talking. And she, it got through. 
she got off the air she said joe pep you talk too much <laughs> and i was like what she said what do we get on what we come on here to talk about and i, I, I said well did we have to, she said lucky i had, to, I had a, a half a minute to play it <laughs> before you got to run in your damn mouth so i you know it's very hard for me to, to uh, answer those questions i can say this that if you were in Detroit and you wanted to be a musician, you wanted to be a dancer, you wanted to do anything in those performing arts, you better be good or you better and you better be committed. Because I mean, I see people walking around Detroit now that, ha that has had so much prominence in their career. And then when you think about all the other folks from Hank Ballard, Lil Willie John, Jackie Wilson, all those folks that we hear the spinners, the the the, the originals, the 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 Falcons, Wilson from Pickett. It was crazy. I mean, it was crazy, and the only way that you can deal with it was compartmentalize. What I'm doing tonight, and you go up, get up at, or get ready at night to go out to do your performance and you happen to look at a newspaper and you see all the other folks that are in town at the same time you are and with the peps i could i could i could never say i think of us performing in any of those venues that we performed in detroit and they weren't sold out or they weren't close to the full ever ever I mean, we became the only person that I've seen that had that kind of popularity there. And we had to, that I had to, to, and the only way that I could see him was to go in between shows at the club that I was playing at one night was Dennis Edwards. Dennis Edwards popped into Detroit one year and started opening at a club. He was the more of a musician that sang at that time. Had his little band and musician that sang. And one night we were on our way to the 20 grand, the chit chat, the 20 grand, 20 grand. And we went past this club it was called malls and there was a line of women all up to the end of the block and i'm like wow you know i never thought about that being a club what they, what they got going on in there never thought about it and then somebody stopped mentioning you ever go to malls one monday night we were going over to catch dennis Edwards, and we went over there we couldn't even get in i mean on a monday night we couldn't get in <laughs> so the only way we could go catch Dennis Edwards to see what he was doing was one night in between the, the, the club that we were playing in, I think the 20 grand and the, on a break, we did three shows. And at the end of the first show, we jumped in the car and ran. Somebody drove us over to Mars. We caught a show over there. Caught Dennis Edwards, caught part of his show, and he was killed. I was like, oh, I understand. This guy's by himself. I mean, he got a nice band. He was playing organ. And he was he was killed. I can't take it away from him. He was killed. And I was like, and he wasn't dancing, wasn't doing nothing, sitting up there playing and singing. He had so much personality. And that was a microcosm of every, mostly all the clubs. It was just about some of those folks were going to make it. A lot of those folks weren't going to make it. And a guy like Barry Gordy at that time had the ability and the and the and the and the vision to say let me go while all this competition is brewing together and pick and choose and pick and choose and that guy nicky stevenson by him being out on the streets he knew where everybody was so he would go and get people and bring them in there and next thing you know boom stevie wonder you know all and so when you're able to pick and choose a, in a in a, an environment of talent where everybody is really competing with themselves you can see somebody that is very free to pain, pain. You see something, she was singing jazz. She wasn't singing no rhythm and blues, the four tops. The very first time I saw the four tops was at a club called uh, um, uh, the Flame Show Bar. And I saw them from the doorway. I wasn't old enough to go in. I was, they cracked the door and I could stand there in the little hall, hallway there and look straight on the stage and watch these guys come out there singing. I mean, nothing like you ever heard of at, at Motown. Anything, period. I mean, a whole different genre. Motown took them 
and turn them into a recording group with the with the sound that that made them famous, top and bottom unisons. But to sing harmony, and I've been around a lot of groups, guys do wop and want to sing harmony. You could not touch the four tops. You could not touch them. If you ever heard the four freshmen, they sound like they copied off the four tops. Well, as you would have never thought the four tops were black. They sang that those pitch and those movements were so they were they were I mean, it was just something to see. And the, for me as a performer to think about how y'all go from that to that. But they had traveled around with some of the biggest acts doing all of that. And this was just a progression to something else, recording. They had never had a recording uh, uh, situation. And I looked at that when um, Norman was putting the, the Undisputed Truth together because I had never seen the female singers before. You know, and I'm used to being on the stage with a ton of testosterone. <laughs> you know where we jump in each other's arms and do the skits and flips over each other's heads and all kind of jump off the stage and one one guy would make sure that he's going to jump off the stage and land in an aisle where I'm on the other side going and land in an aisle where in the splits and Tommy would jump and go across the table and come down in the splits and we all come up and all that kind of stuff I mean that's what that was what it was known for and so I had to rethink I put myself in a Motown frame of mind. I had a lot of friends over there. And um, and to really not try to uh, see what I wanted to see because I didn't know. I didn't know what it was going to be like. And the only thing that uh, uh, that my suggestion or my input in the in the original concept was the group was that I did not want to be a male singer with two background singers singing on the side of me. I didn't want to be in no, nothing like that because that is, it, it is so, to me, has been so limited because they weren't going to ever do anything but that. I've never seen a very active lead singer with two female singers that did anything other than stand over there and look cute. And I want to perform it because, I'm, you know, I couldn't rehearse no show, you know, like a, like uh, 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 a lot of the big acts, we put those shows together and rehearse it and rehearse it. I did that once I uh, put the Undisputed Truth together after, for those, uh, for you plus me and all those things, we rehearsed six months in SIR in LA, you familiar with that. And we Norman have us in there every day from six, from 12 to six, the singers and the musicians. And when those musicians came out of there, they went to the studio, Rose Rush, with those, which guys would end up being Rose Rush, they would go in. They didn't, we didn't flip flop like that until after Rose Rush became an entity. But at, 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 when we were putting a, putting a lot of the other groups, when Norman would put all his groups into um, SIR to, to, so that he was trying to steal a little of the Motown thing. You've got to rehearse these people every day so that when they go on the stage, they would have a concept. We hadn't gotten to the point where we would stage the whole show. We didn't do that until Rose Royce got great. I mean, they had those gold and double platinums and all this, so it became uh, a necessity, you know, to take the 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 street out of it and 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 present that act as a polished act, playing off the cool in the gang with a female. See, so that was kind of the concept that Norman and I were talking about. In fact, the girl that ended up with uh, Rose Rush was actually, I brought her back or had her come back to be, to L.A. to be the new lead singer in The Undisputed Truth. But that movie was up and I wasn't released from my contract in Motown. And Car Wash at that time was, a, a, was something like a sequel to Cooley High. Mm -hmm. Now, Motown had the record recording rights to all the music of Cooley High, which was Cooley High is a cult film right now. But the music was more profitable than the movie. Smokey did the, the music, and that's when the Boys to Men came out. You know, you know, but that song, they put uh, all time greatest song from It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to that. And when Norman was leaving Motown and we were forming Whitfield Records in LA, my contract was, I was still under contract to uh, uh with it so in order for me to get out of that norman to get me out of that it spent a lot of cost him a lot of money and the rights to that song you plus me 
which ended up going to Motown. See, but I couldn't be, I couldn't, I, I wasn't allowed to have any part in the film. I was going to be, the, the music was going to be done by Undisputed Truth. But Norman kept the project and we were riding to Vegas one day and I was like, man, it's really, I, I said, man, it's really bothering me that that soundtrack is just going out there as a soundtrack. I said, man, we got so much stuff on the track. Somebody need to be able to make, Norman turned around on the highway. Came all the way back. We got to Warner Brothers just be oh to MCA just before they were closing. In fact, they were closing. There was a few people that Norman went in there and caught the guy that he was looking for, and they sat down there and they was they was elated with that idea, you know. And we stayed. We didn't go to Vegas. We stayed there. Had the guys in the group come together, and we said, "Look, uh, we got to. When you guys going to be an act?" From the film, and that was the beginning of Rose Royce. Wow, that's so much history, Joe. Uh, and it's hard to, it's hard to, you know. And you're talking about forty and fifty years in between then and now, you know, because I mean the things that basically, like I ended up into, was, you know, after my Motown um, uh, stint, you know, that really set me up for what was happening with Whitfield. Well, I want to go back, though, Joe, to uh, the earlier part of Undisputed Truth. Okay. So um, it was you and the two girls, which was, you know, something different, like you said. But um, what was the concept beyond that that was sort of presented to you for that? Because, and how, how, how was it decided which material that you guys would do? General concept was a cross between Sly and the Family Stone and the Fifth Dimension. Now, you, you can visualize that as a, from a performer, you don't see no background singers, nowhere. Everybody is an individual, is a participant in the act. You know, everybody has a, a, has a, 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 an image to pertain. If, if, if all the, uh, the only other group in, in Motown at that particular time, because at that time, I mean, they had the spinners, you didn't know everybody in the spinners. You know, it took a string of hits before everybody's face became, you know, oh, he's saying with the spins, you know, or they did that. So what we did was to, we wanted to 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 be a self-contained group. Uh, Papa was a Rolling Stone. You say we covered that we would, we did the original of that. The Temptations did the cover of that. That's another story. I put that in the book. I don't want that to be. Uh, I have to say that like it was, and I wanted to be in the book because I mean that is something that I did an interview in England, and the guy said, "You know what? We never would have known that if you hadn't said it." Most people don't say that, but I was telling it like it happened and like it was. But I, you know, but that's the, and and I was going back to the concept. Uh, uh, Norman Whitfield wanted. Um, uh, he, he, he figured that if I can cross the fifth dimensions and slide the family stone without mimicking them, then I can have a group where the participation in the group with the, with the male and the female members could be something that would be more of an entertainment thing rather than just a singer and a backup and two backups. So uh, everybody had lead parts. You see, smiling faces. Your turn, your turn, your turn. So we, we, we that groomed them for that. Now those girls were like I say, they were very, very great. Brenda still very excellent singer, great ear. You know, they sang behind Stevie on Ain't No Mind. I mean, um, Stevie on um, uh, Sign Seal Delivered. Uh, they have a background on with Diana Ross on Ain't No Mountain High Enough with Matt, with uh, uh, Valerie Simpson, and uh, it's the backup with the Four Tops on Steel Waters. So, so we all those things, Norman would give me some product, products, projects so that they can build their repertoire. And once folks started hearing the, them singing in the background, they did a lot of backup things at Motown. Though I just mentioned some of the things that happened to be big hits, you know, and uh, and in fact, Brenda was telling me a couple of weeks ago that after her solo career uh, went to uh, up to a stagnant, she went on the road with another lady that sang with me with Eddie Kendricks. So they she ended up her stuff with Motown 
well, with Eddie Kendricks after Boogie Down and all those things, and she was on the road with Eddie all the time. So she kept up to that, and then she raised raised her kids. Um, uh, but that was uh, that was how we was foreseeing it. And when I say without planning it, we have to let it happen. I sit today, and that was whole, Norman's whole thing. Every time we went in the studio, he would notice that study of Sly Stone and George Clinton. And and I worked with George Clinton for 10 years after Atomic Dog, so I really knew what Norman was, that way he was coming from. With us, you learn how to be creative in the studio rather than going in the studio rehearsed. I never went in the studio with Norman Whitfield on any project, rehearsing it before I went in there. And today, after I've been producing for many years now, I understand the logic in that because how do you keep what you did well? If you rehearse something and you got it down pat, and you keep rehearsing and you don't get it, it don't repeat itself like that. But when you're in the studio, when you get it down pat, you capture it. So that's your that's your that's the standard. You know, it took me two and a half, almost three hours to do the first two words in smiling faces. And it got so frustrating for me because the first thing Norman did when I realized, I heard the track, but it wasn't called Smiling Faces. So when Norman told me what he was gonna do to that track, because I, I remember when he first got, when we first started, after we first got together and had our very first meeting with him, we was talking about recording. He was asking me about some things that we may wanna do that were already recorded. And the Temptations happened to have Smiling Faces, the musical version, really, that's what it was. And Norman was preparing himself mentally to do films. So he had that big film track with, with, the, with the Temptations spotted and singing in between. I loved it. And uh, when he told me before we were going in the studio that we were going to, the song was going to be Smiling Faces, and he's saying, don't listen to Eddie. Well, how was I not going to go listen to Eddie? I went and listened to Eddie, Lord, and I was, I was so many motherfuckers and <laughs> So and he made me sit down for about an hour. He said, because you got to get that out your head. You know, I don't want you doing something. I don't want that. Get Eddie to do that with a new track. You know, so w when I came back to finish, he's, this is what we did. He was, putting the, he was putting parts on. When I came back to finish, we went to the end of the song. I was having a hard time saying smiling faces because he wanted to create the, he wanted you to see it. He said, I don't want you to sing that. Eddie King, smiling faces. Son, he's singing it. He wanted it seen. I'm fresh. I had no, never had a producer like this. This this is the second time, the second project that I did with him. The first one was Save My Love for a Rainy Day, which was a track that he had wrote for Marvin Gaye after too busy thinking about my baby. But Marvin Gaye was uh, somewhere in the world creating what's going on. So Norman had come up with that track, and that was the first thing that we did. And um, when he took it to uh, uh, quality control, you know, that's where they bring the music and people listen to it to, to determine what they wanted to release as a company. He didn't tell them who it was. He played it. And everybody everybody jumped on that, on that song. And Norman came back and said, y'all got to release. <laughs> See, I hadn't planned it like that. This was just something for me to get in the studio to become familiar with where I wanted to go. We got a release. Everybody didn't get a release at Motown because there was a whole lot of folks in there. Some with some big names couldn't get a release because there's this new group in there got that spot. You know, which was usually uh, a cycle that goes around. Okay, we got this eight. Okay, this eight. So we was we came in and made eight nine. So somebody didn't get no release on that day. And uh, uh, that, those were, that's where the competition came inside of Motown. See, so it wasn't like, okay, we put my record up there. No, 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 no. You can be in that studio and you can be creative and you can do all this, but if you don't have it in, in your mind that you're going to be judged by these people, these eight or nine people in quality control to determine whether or not you're going to get a release in this quarter and you don't want to get pushed out of your quarter because the next quarter 
you know, it's Gladys Knight and all those people, you know, so every quarter got a, got a big mix of people in there. And you don't want to get in somebody else and be the ninth in somebody else's. So you figure they, they was rolling at that time. People do their eight and they release these eight. They release their eight. So we came in there and it bumped somebody out of there. Norman never told me he didn't want to get into, perhaps to get into the competition. But the next time for the next release was Smiling Faces. So when Norman went to quality control with Smiling Faces, then they came up with a whole plan. Okay, then, okay. So this is going to be, this is the one we're going for, and let's work on the album. So we started picking and choosing things to try to create a, a, a foundation. So that when we went, when we went um, uh, live, we had some something to stand on except things that we had just recorded, you know, except all new music. And that was the things that kind of, um, mold us into being able to become more recording minded than just performance performance mind to see what you're going to, rather than the sound like you had with Norman Whitfield you had to do it all it had to be seen it had to be seen so you know if you listen to those temptation songs a lot of those songs I mean I sung before they were ever to record it but when Norman, when they went to the Temptations and he went to come out of the session with it, it was totally different from what I had been. I was like, you know, and I couldn't figure out what I was like. Well, I'm going to say, look, I got my part to do. I, you know, and I'm familiar because if you notice, Norman had did many remakes on a many of his songs. Look at Gladys Knight and Marvin Gaye, Smokey and the Temps all did great now. And if you listen to him, there's a difference in every one of them. In the presentation of it, you know, it's not somebody mimicking the head. You wondering how I knew it then wasn't, it wasn't that, you know. I mean, in the very in the version on that very first, I mean, uh, Vine on that very first Undisputed Truth record, I could never get Marvin Gaye out of my head, and boy, I was cussed out so many times, and we worked our way through it. I mean, he just he just accepted it because. Now I know what he was trying to get, and he was very hard. It's like me trying to explain it to you and a lot of folks. Unless you do this, it's very hard to uh, really understand what you are trying to do. You know, uh, I'm with the number one writer and producer in the world, and I'm looking for guidance. He's looking for guidance from me to know, to be able to take him where he needs to go. and. After a while, I mean, after maybe a couple of albums, I think I got it down. By the time we got to Papa Was a Rolling Stone, I had it down pat then. See, so I mean, I was a little more comfortable, a lot more familiar. And when I listen to our first album today, I'm kind of, I have a lot of mixed emotions because I, I see myself in the studio and hearing all the hard times I had on everything. I can hear what Norman said, I see you thinking. I don't want you thinking. I want your confidence. I don't need no thinking. I don't want you thinking. It's thinking. <laughs> and if you get that meeting, he will give you a tongue lashing. You know, and I'm like, come on, come on, one more. Because I mean, it's very competitive. Then, yeah, then he, when, he, when he get when he get combative, then you know that it's about work. He tired. <laughs> the first album was called Face to Face with the Truth, right? Um, the Undisputed Truth. That's yeah. the first album. The face is the second album. Okay, that's the second album. Yeah. So the when you first, first album, when you first heard Smiling Faces take off, what was that experience like? Ooh, Lord have mercy, Scott. I mean, let me tell you something. And I'm a guy. I never had a hit record. And we never. When it, I mean, when it was, I mean, it went rolling, and then all of a sudden you start hearing your record at the top of the album. And at the, you know how that go, and at the, on the top of the hour, the number one record, boom, and then whatever town you're in, and then 12, 30, here it is again. You know, so, and then every all my friends, everybody, oh, so I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, I, you, that's when you know that you have gotten to a point that, and then it's, it's, it's got a lot to do with luck. It's got a lot to do with timing and preparation. You know, I, I mean, I could sit back and kind of halfway exhale, but it was always about with Norman Whitfield, we got to top that. <laughs> top that. <laughs> we got to 
top that. I did this one song with Norman, uh, Friendship Train, Unite the World. Uh, Yunganga, uh, uh, I can't see the African name Norman used. And I wanted to, I, I, the things that I heard that I wanted to do, that song was so, um, uh, I thought was, was uh, 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 for me. And we got that album version out and did it. And then when he did it with Dennis Edwards, God have mercy, Lord have mercy. You know, uh, uh, you know people in the world, let me see. Um, um, uh, you can't be no bigger than the one you were in. I mean, if he had some lyrics in this in this thing that was, I mean, it, it made the singer think, you know. And Dennis Edwards was, was so on to every in, in your window. And Norman said, "I like to put words in Dennis Edwards' mouth." He said because when you put him in his mouth, he paints the picture with, it. you know. And it don't look like a guy did did a whole lot of stroking. He just painted. He's the best, he said. I mean, and these are the things that he used to talk about that he's ever said in the studio because Norman Whitfield was a taskmaster. He'd push you and push you. And he said, Gladys Knight is the, is the, is the artist, a, a, a producer's dream in the studio. He said, I write words for her and she said, he said, she moaned, David Ruffin, when he started doing David Ruffin, listen to the very first things Norman did with David Ruffin. But if you knew Norman, you would hear Norman Whitfield. David Ruffin listened to Norman, and Norman can't sing, but he got so much soul. I mean, even when I was his voice be all up, but the soul in it, you just be, you could catch yourself being entertained. And he'd be serious. He would look on his face trying to make those things happen, and you know what he mean, you know? And uh, he said Gladys Knight would just almost whisper that stuff out of my mouth. <laughs> like, I was mad at her. I think I want to sing like that so bad. And I learned a lot of things from his conversations about these 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 people. That's why I know that, and I talk about these things because I never really got an opportunity to. And I sit there and listen to him. He come back after he come out of the studio. Only one time I went to a session with the temps with him, and that was... Uh, he was trying he, we left a session that we were doing the temp paul williams was in town to finish the song that he was doing uh that norman was doing oh girl why won't you talk to me on the phone every time you disguise your voice and you're not uh, running away and um, um uh, i sit there and watch that watch that session that night and i knew that this was this whole process was something special you know, you 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 compartmentalize, compartmentalize yourself or individualize yourself, but you see, you're a part of a whole lot of things. This guy's working with that and doing that, and you know, part. And this guy came in off the road to finish this one song so that album can go out. And we went there almost all night, and I thought that I was the only person in the world catch hell in the studio with Norman Whitfield. And then when I saw Paul going over and seeing him, I could hear his thinking and see him trying to give Norman what he wanted. I was like, oh, I felt so good. <laughs> I was like, so good. But when he finished, Lord have mercy, Norman took that, he took bad parts and mixed them and found a good word out of a bad part and stuck it in there. And I was like, Lord have mercy. <laughs> but we was in there over a hundred takes. You know, so Norman said, okay, this didn't, you know, because he never rehearsed it. He came in there and started singing it. Because you can hear, oh, girl. You know, because Norman was giving him all those things. And then Paul taking and put his voice in that. And then started living it. And then Norman would never stop him. he let him do so much. And then he'd go back and fix it a little bit. But he'd always see that word right there. You see him, I see him telling Angie that that word right there, mark that. Because he go, whatever it is, that word, he, the way Paul said it, it's just stood out in the phrasing and the interpretation of what he was trying to get him to say. And this guy, and I'm looking at this guy trying to see how he's taking a word and putting it in the spot of a, of a whole verse and making it makes the difference. When you hear it, you're like, dang. But that comes, and he normally said that comes from being in, in that competitive machine of Motown. 
where he stood in there and watched Smokey and a lot of those other producers, Holland Dozier Holland doing things and, and all some of those things. He was playing tambourines and hand claps and foot stumps. All those things mattered and made he used them to make a difference in the way the music was pushed and how it when you want to hear that boom, that, that one, he put that hand clap and the boom, boom, had the footsteps running through all that. Boom, 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 boom. That's mostly a very strong kind of thing. And but Norman used it with the George Clinton kind of overtone to it, so that it pump roll you funk you. Boom, you funk you. That's the way he, oh Norman say funk you. Boom, funk you. And make and you know, all of a sudden I'll be saying that, but you, when you ain't saying it, you can hear the music saying it. And Norman and the musicians get it and they get it and they just roll with it. It was, it was, it was very cinematic and uh, very orchestrated, you know. He was. This is Norman Whitfield was the guy that secretly wanted to be a performer, and he had the in the studio because the Earl Van Dyke and all Jameson, all those guys used to laugh at him, and he didn't care. He just made sure all this. We they used they used, Eddie Eddie, uh, Eddie Bongo used to always when Norman went in there, he used to be Norman and be trying to do make that little movement. Norman's gonna turn it into a dance. Them guys be cracking up, but they love working with him. I mean, you could have a guy doing that, but Norman would had his body in it, you know. And I was like, "Woo!" Took his shirt off. He'd come out of there sweating like a pig. <laughs> I was like, "Dang!" And they come out of them tracks. Be that, that track of of uh, of uh, uh, Grapevine on that very first album. Man, Lord have mercy! If you can hear all the stuff going on on that album musically, I was scared. I mean, first of all, I'm singing a Marvin Gaye song beat song and the track is kicking me all up in the butt because you can't be comfortable like well you're wondering how i knew so i'm trying to jana he got another different vibe going on in that jana it's drama you know not here today i just get mad he said i ain't worried about that that's i just wanted to cover on that i, I wanted to be something you know but norman had a, a, a he had a deadline and he had to make it you know and i and I today for a long time I felt like, dang. Norman told me many years later, he said, You can't, you're not responsible for what you don't know. He said, But you can listen to what you did and learn a million things. And it'll teach you a million things. And uh today uh I am so uh I am so grateful for the lesson. You know, that was a blessing that I got being with Norman Whitfield all those years. You know, I, I know that it had to be something because of my best friend at that time who ended up going on the road with me and staying with me all through California on the road with all those groups we had to put together. We put most of the groups together at which all the groups really together at Whitfield Records Rolls Royce, Stargard. Uh, uh, there was, well, uh, Mammy Tappy was another group that Norman brought in, and um, uh, uh, Masterpiece was another group that Norman brought in that I would have picked them from anywhere. I tried to bring Howard Hewitt in at that time. He was a little young group called uh, Beverly Hills, and I, I almost brought those that group in there, and um, uh, Homeboy over at um, with the Shalomar and all those um, um, uh, Leon Silvers had a lot. He he had hit records, so he snatched him and got him over there. All those acts over there, you know, Norman would really give them a listen to if I brought him because he knew I knew what kind of person he was. He said everything. We had a meeting. He said everybody Jordan brought in here. Um, we got golden plaque. We gotta keep thinking like that. He said, "I'm Barry Gordon today. I'm happy." He said, "Don't bring me nobody in here if they can't get gold and platinum." And when the girl came from Florida, uh, and we were working on the sound, on the music for the soundtrack, you know, and Norman really then he had somebody to go in there and sing, and he just, I mean, he flowed through it. Then I mean, it, I, I seen this guy start writing song after song after he got car wash done. And the girl, Gwen Dickey, she might hear this, see this thing, but she know. <laughs> she told me, she called me one day and she said, you motherfucker. I always wanted to sing my life. And I go to California and I'm singing in the studios with a, a lot of goddamn cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that was so funny. She said, I'm the best producer in the world who do Gladys Knight and the Temptations. And I'm singing car wash. <laughs> she said, with some guy, with some strangers. I say, baby, it's a, it's a, we don't worry about it because it's going to be very important. <laughs> and I seen her, uh, we did a thing in London, I think maybe six years ago, five years ago. The last time I played London, she was headlining. And um, it was a bunch of us, uh, uh, one of the guys from Booker T from the MGs, uh, one of the guys that used to be leading the uh, average white band, Percy Sledge, it was that kind of a soulful show. And Gwen Dickey, who was in um, living in London now. And she sat on that stage and sang those songs that Norman did that Norman sat there and wrote for her, and you can just, I saw all the efforts. I mean, I saw it paying off from that song about a car wash. <laughs> and she come on stage, I say, what do you think about car wash now? Because them people started singing car wash, she did the Joe Tex, just let them do the whole song. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the audience started singing, the whole audience started performing the whole song, and she was there sitting on the stage, on the stage, she was holding the mic, and, Oh, yeah, you know, and that I say, see, that's how you become a legend. You know, when those folks singing your stuff like that, you know, and they love you, that's that's a, that's appreciation. But the key is the song. When we when Norman and I split, he told me one thing. He said, you got to use what you got to get what you want. He said, you may not understand that now. He said, but you're gonna understand it later when you start trying. In other words. I didn't give you the repertoire. You got to make it work for you. I mean, in more ways than one, the lessons, you know, the, you got the experience, you got the material. And from a Motown point of view, when I was, when, when the girls and I were together, when we were talking, we, we can do our show built around a Norman Whitfield songbook, but we decided that we're going to do a Norman Whitfield medley in there from all his artists. From all the things that Norman Whitfield would have put that in our show. And then today, people want to hear a variety of things until we, we're working on uh, doing an album. Now we're just going to get started with that in the next month or so. So that's basically where, I, where we're at. You know, I remember I told you, Martha Jean said, Joe Pepper, you talk to Martha Jean. <laughs>